Hi, how are you? I would love for you to share one thing that you are praising God for. Just one thing. It can be the same thing. You can swap that with whoever you meet and greet. Okay? All right. So please all stand, meet and greet, and let's praise our Lord. Excellent. It was good to see so much energy and so many things we can praise the Lord for, right? Just even on the spot. And that was the thought that struck me as I started preparing for this message is, and the challenge I said to myself, is when last have we just suddenly and spontaneously burst out in praise for our wonderful and awesome God? When last have we done that? I mean, on Sundays we sing songs that praise Him, so it's kind of programmed in. But when, in your day, have you just stopped and praised the Lord for something? In the passage we're studying today, Jude, the last two verses, is what's called a doxology. A doxology. It's nothing to do with dogs. It's a doxology with an X. And the word comes from the Greek word doxologia, which means praise or glory. And it's a combination of the Greek word for glory, which is doxa, and the word logos, meaning a speaking. So a speaking of glory. But the interesting thing about doxologies is that over the centuries, they've become very formulaic, very programmed in. And in fact, they are a standard part of church tradition. Some of you may be familiar with the the, the, the doxology. Many churches have the doxology that is sung either at the end of a service or even as an ending to a hymn. You will click into the doxology. Oftentimes, these doxologies are sung without any real thought to the meaning of the words uh, contained therein. And I guess until I had done this preparation, my experience of doxologies, if you had asked me, I would have said, well, isn't that something that the Catholic Church does? Well, the Anglican Church, so they do doxologies, don't they? 
Um, in fact, when I was um, in primary school, my first primary school was, in, was attached to an Anglican chapel. And I remember in the mornings, we'd go to chapel and we'd sing a doxology. But the reality is, is that the Bible is full of doxologies, full of passages where the authors pause and turn to God and pour out praise and glory to Him. Deuteronomy 32 verses 3 to 4 is an example. Uh, these words may sound familiar. It says, Ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all His ways are justice, a God of truth and with injustice, without injustice, righteous and upright is He. That was the first song that we sung this morning. The Psalms too are full of outbursts of praise to God. Uh, Psalm 72 reads, Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to His glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with His glory. Amen and Amen. And I encourage you this morning, when we praise the Lord, you may say a hearty Amen. And it's not just the Old Testament that shows us how praiseworthy God really is. Also in the New Testament, we find a number of doxologies or sections of praise where the, the author turns to just praising the Lord. Uh, for instance, at the beginning of Ephesians, Paul writes this. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And it's not just Paul. Peter ends his second epistle, Second Peter, uh, saying, but grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. And so we see that praises are an important part of the believer's life. And so even in this book, as we conclude, a book that is a, about a warning about false teachers and the judgment that these teachers will face, and the actions we need to take as believers, it is not surprising then that Jude, having written all about that, completes his book with this praise. And in Jude 24 and 25 he writes, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time now and forever amen and so in this marvelous end to this book jude is reminding us that we need to praise god and he's showing us that we can always praise god for two things we can praise god for what he has done for us and we can praise god for who he is so let's let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer Father, we just come before you again, and uh, as we prayed before, we, we just ask that as we learn some more of this truth from your word, Lord, that our, our hearts would be um, open and receptive to your words, Lord, that we would um, be able to examine ourselves and our lives, Lord, and uh, make the changes that would be pleasing to you. Lord, we thank you for the incredible reminder we have of how praiseworthy you are. And we, we pray that, uh, having learned what um, Jude has before us, Lord, that we would be conscious to praise you more often. Pray, pray this all in your son's precious name. Amen. So if you haven't, please turn to Jude, uh, second last book in the Bible, and we're going to be looking at verses 24 and 25. And true to form, um, I almost want to call Jude the microwave book because you get in a few short verses, you know, an entire sort of long epistle's worth of content. And um, in these few short verses, we're going to learn about the reasons we have to praise God. So looking at verse 24, and verse 24 starts off, we looked this right at the start there. Um, it says there, to him. It starts off with the phrase, to him. 
Some versions actually say now to him, depending on the version you are reading from. And it's a reminder to us about when is the best time to praise the Lord. And the best time to praise the Lord is now. And if you haven't praised him now, then the next best time to praise him is now. Right? It's actually great that Jude starts off this little last section this way. He's been so busy dealing with the thing he felt compelled to write about. Remember, he wanted to write about the gospel and the deeper truths of the gospel, but he felt compelled to write about false teachers and I need to contend for, to compete for uh, the faith. And he's just concluded the section that we heard um, last week about the role the believer has to play in contending. How are we going to fight? How are we going to... How are we going to compete for our faith against these false teachers who are already doomed and judged? And then, having done all that, he can't help but now turn to his Lord and praise him. And so he starts off saying, now to him. And so that is a reminder to us that there's never a bad time to praise the Lord. Jude isn't praising God because of false teachers. In fact, you might say it's unusual that he's praised here because it's such a gloomy subject. We spent a number of Sundays going, oh, it's such a gloomy book. Oh, it's such a gloomy subject. Oh, all the false teaching out there. But the point here is Jude isn't looking at that. He's not praising the Lord for his circumstances. He's praising the Lord despite the circumstances. Despite the fact that there is this issue that must be dealt with, this threat of false teaching. He is praising the Lord. And that's because now is the time to praise the Lord. We don't praise the Lord because of things that are going right in our life. We don't praise Him because things have gone well. We praise Him for who He is. We praise Him for what He's done. And that's what we're going to unpack now. And so it doesn't matter what kind of day we have it. It doesn't matter what kind of week it's been. It doesn't matter what kind of challenge we're in the midst of. What kind of trial we're facing. It's always the right time to stop and to turn and to praise the Lord. And so that's what Jude is showing us here at the start of this verse. And then Jude goes on to praise God for two things that God has done. The first thing that he praises him for is the way that God preserves our earthly testimony. God preserves our earthly testimony. And he writes there, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. He's able to keep you from stumbling. Now, what that really means, stumbling, for believers, means sinning. It means something has gone wrong and we have stumbled in our walk with the Lord and we have sinned. And it's a really good question because, I don't know about you, sometimes you just think about, well, how can we not stumble? Uh, Particularly when it comes to this whole concept of false teaching and false religions. I mean, if you look around, it feels like that's the norm, not the exception, right? Um, So many churches, even churches who on the outside look like they are like-minded, are preaching and teaching ideas that are wrong. And it's so easy to stumble. Some churches are adding to the gospel. Well, you're saved, but have you had the second blessing? Some churches, it's all about the sensual worship. If worship isn't 45 minutes and highly emotional and half your congregation is kind of in an emotional trance, they don't see that as successful. Some churches adopt what they call um, a seeker-sensitive approach. If you go into a church like that, you won't even know you're in a church. You'll think you're in a really cool coffee shop with a band. Uh, Many churches, the focus on a faithful walk with God has been replaced by a focus on numbers and income. Success is about how many more people have come through the doors and how the giving has grown. In other churches, the quest for holiness has been replaced by a pursuit of health, wealth, and prosperity. These days, it feels like when you walk into a Christian bookstore, it's these ideas you see on the shelves. And so it is easy to stumble. We're surrounded by this false teaching all around. But Jude is reminding us that God is able to keep us from stumbling. Despite 
all of these things around us, despite the pressures in our lives, despite the temptations that we face. The question is how? He is able, but will he? Or, or when will he? How does that work? And um, the simple answer is this. We have to be growing as believers. We have to be growing. We can't just be coming every Sunday and getting a reminder of who God is. We have to be growing in Him. That's actually what Pastor Carl was teaching us last week. We have to grow. We have to be learning more about Him. We have to be becoming a bit more like Him. We have to be mastering more of the Word. Uh, Peter talks about this. In 2 Peter 3, 17, he says, uh, Therefore, dear friends, and what he is writing right at the end of 2 Peter, where he also deals with the topic of um, different heresies and false teachings and objections that are there to the gospel. He says, Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard. Be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position. And then he says in verse 18, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we have to be on our guard and we have to grow. Those are the things we need to do. And if we are on our guard and if we are growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, then he will keep us from stumbling. That's how it works. And so how do we stay on our guard? Well, that was last week's lesson. Um, we have to remember the words of the apostles we learned in verse 20. We have to remember the, the prophecies and the, the truths that are in the Bible. And when we're in those situations, apply them. We have to build ourselves up in the faith. We have to study God's word. We have to get to know more of it. We have to memorize it. So it's here. And we have to pray in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit is not some strange mystical thing. It's praying according to God's will. We have to pray for guidance. We have to pray for holiness. Pray for growth. Um, I enjoyed when Pastor Carl was praying for the church this morning. You know, he prayed, as Scripture di directs us to pray, that we would grow in grace. Uh, we have to keep ourselves in God's love, confessing our sin. We have to wait on God's mercy. We have to do these things, not just know about these things, because if we don't, that's when we become vulnerable. And it's just when we're not doing these things, that's when we are prone to stumble. And before we know it, somewhere we could be hooked on some false doctrine, some false teaching. You know those ones that are nicely packaged, they have their beautifully packaged books, they have the DVDs, they're in the podcasts, Incredible production value, but no spiritual value. And so it's important that we continuously immerse ourselves in the God's truth. There's a story, a well-known story, about um, someone who was being taken around a bank. And uh, the manager of the bank was showing them the tellers. And they were talking about counterfeits. And uh, this visitor was saying, you know, sure. How do, you, how do you train your tellers to spot counterfeit notes? Because you must get a lot of that. Uh, you know, do you keep all the ones you catch and then sort of train them on how to spot the differences and those kinds of things? And the manager replied and he said, no, we never do that. He said, all we do is we make sure that they only ever handle the genuine article." In their training, they only ever handle real cash. And the visitor was amazed. He's like, but how does that work? And he said, it's once you know what the genuine note is like, you will always be able to spot any counterfeit. Because it's always different. And it's the same with us as believers. We have to immerse ourselves every day in God's truth. That way, when we come across something that is not God's truth, we'll know it. We don't have to be experts on all the false teaching out there. We don't have to be experts to know all this thing and that thing. We, all we have to do is be experts on God's Word. And then we'll know. Actually, that doesn't sound right. I'm not going to go over it. Actually, I don't think what they're saying in that program, I don't think I'm going to do it. Actually, what that teacher is saying, I actually don't think I agree with it. So we 
we've got to be growing. We've got to be on our guards. Um, if we're not, we could end up staying in churches that do teach error, uh, that are weak. Churches that are promoting an emotional high rather than real spiritual development. So we have to be on our guard, we have to keep growing, and we have to remember that God is able to keep us from stumbling. And that's something that we can praise Him for. In the Psalms, the writer says, The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in Him. Though he may stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with His hand. That's a promise we can cling to and we can praise our Lord for. Not only does God preserve our testimony and help us not stumble, but God also preserves our eternal destiny. Preserves our eternal destiny. Let's read on here in verse 24. And it goes on to say, um, it says there, and to present you, so he can keep you from stumbling and... He is able to present you before His glorious presence without fault and with great joy. Stop and think about what that verse is saying. I'll read it again. Well, that part of the verse. And to present you before His glorious presence without fault and great joy. Okay? This is an amazing verse. This verse is telling all of us, all believers what our destiny is. This is something that will happen for all of us. Let's unpack it a little bit. Because here we are seeing the fulfillment of our salvation. The whole reason or outcome of us being saved is written here. And we see the culmination of God's plan. The plan that He had, which was to take sinful men and women, redeem them, and ultimately to make them spotless and free from sin. So let's look more closely. The first thing we see is that we are presented. It says there he's going to present, he's able to present you. And this is literal. Literally Christ will present us, the church, to himself in a magnificent occasion of celebration. Uh, this, this occasion is known as the wedding feast of the Lamb. And it is going to be amazing. And Christ will be there, just like a father presents a bride to her bridegroom. Christ will be presenting the church, pictured as his bride, to himself. And it's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. Now for those of you who survived last night's game, just think about this. Imagine the, the Springboks win the World Cup again. And now has come the time, the ceremony, to present them as the winners of this competition to the rest of the world. How's it going to be? Is it going to be like half-hearted? You know, we're going to kind of like just get, get it done. Let's get through it. Can you, can you imagine if like whoever the French president, whoever comes up with a trophy and is like, mm, well, here's this thing, I'll just put it over there. You know, maybe our captain kind of sheepishly picks it up and thanks. It's not going to be like that at all, right? It's going to be amazing. They're going to be so excited. We're going to be celebrating. There'll be confetti. The entire country will be, um, you know, shouting and screaming for joy. And we will all be proud of them. Their, their people there will be proud of them. They will be proud of each other. And it'll be a fantastic time. Kind of in the same way, this is what this wedding feast of the Lamb is like, but like a hundred times better. It is a celebration. It is a time where Christ proudly presents His church to Himself. And that's the thing I want us to focus on now. It turns out we get a sneak preview of this occasion in the book of Revelation. And I'd love you to turn there with me. If you'd like to turn to Revelation 19, uh, verse 6. Revelation verse... Uh, chapter 19 verse 6 and John is writing here and he's here's what he writes he says then I heard what sounded like a multitude just a huge amount of people and beings like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting 
It's a bit like when you're in a stadium and the whole stadium is going crazy and they're screaming. It sounds like a roar of thunder. But here's what this multitude is, is shouting. They're shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come. What an incredible occasion it's going to be. Um, and in the middle of it is us, the church, and Christ beaming with pride as we are presented to Him, um, fulfilling this goal of salvation. And so that's the thing I want you to think about is, do you have the right view of how God thinks about us? Do you have the right idea, view, of how God thinks about us? Because I think sometimes that when you ask believers how God feels about them, we almost feel a little bit embarrassed, or we feel a little bit uncertain, or we feel a bit guilty. We're like, well, kind of like God just let us in in the back door. Or maybe, you know, I don't know how, but, but yeah, yeah. Some of us may say, well, I know God loves me, because we've been taught that. But the challenge here is these verses say that God loves us. Are we living our lives feeling that? Are we living our lives with this thing ahead of us, this guaranteed event, where God is going to proudly present us to himself as his bride? That's how he feels about us. Are we living our lives now realizing that? Because that's how it feels about it. I was chatting to one of my family and saying, you know, do you know how proud God is of us? Do you realize that? And um, I had a great answer. The answer is like, but why? They were taken aback, like, why? Why would God be proud of me? I haven't done anything. What have I done that's made him proud? I thought it was a great question. And the answer is, God is not proud of us because of what we've done. He's proud of us because of who we are. He's proud of us because of who we are now in Christ. You see, God has prepared us for this moment. He's prepared us for the ceremony. He has made us ready. And He has enacted this incredible truth that we call the Gospel as the way of preparing us all for this occasion. You might say, but I have so many faults. Uh, you know, I'm a sinner. I've done so many things wrong. And that's a wonderful thing. Is that this ceremony? They're all forgotten. They're gone. No one is talking about those things. Christ will say, I have died, that they have been so that they be, may be forgiven and forgotten. And when all our sins are paid for and stripped away and gone, what's left? Only our new man, our new pure holy souls. You remember from Romans, we spoke about salvation having different stages. First, we are justified. That is when we are forgiven from our sin and God swaps Jesus' righteousness for our sin. Um, an easy way to remember it is justification is just as if I had not sinned. And then we have sanctification, which is where we are now, where as believers we are learning to live lives that are worthy of that righteousness. And then when we die, we are glorified. So we finally get rid of this sinful body and we are given our new bodies and we are glorified. And all of that is the preparation that leads to this incredible ceremony, this incredible celebration where we will be formally presented to Christ. Um, and we will be holy and blameless. But not only that, if you read further in Revelation 19, um, it says there, Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. And verse 8, Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. We not only may be pure and blameless and holy, we are going to be stunningly radiant, resplendent, uh, amazing. Because we will be clothed in 
all the righteous acts of the church of the saints. Picture in your mind the most amazingly beautiful bride. And picture in your mind the most amazingly noble bridegroom. And that is just a small fraction of what it's going to be like for us. This is our destiny. And God will present us proudly in the ceremony. And so surely this needs to affect how we live today. This is the, this is the destiny awaiting us. Then how we live today needs to change. And just like if a bride is preparing for her wedding, if she does certain things, we'd think she's crazy, right? So if she suddenly is knowing that this amazing wedding's coming and she goes, ah, oh, yeah, I think I'll look up all my old boyfriends and just, you know, rekindle the friendship. We'd be like, are you mad? Or if you meet her and she's like walking around going, oh, end of single life, this is so terrible. We'd be like, you're crazy. But the funny thing is we do that as believers. We have this amazing event waiting for us. We're going to be united with our Savior. How are we living our lives? Are we looking around and being distracted by the things of today, the problems of today? Are we taking our eye off him, our bridegroom, and getting involved in other stuff? The old boyfriend? You don't have to do that. With friends, we need to be focused on this destiny. And when we are in trial, or when we are confronted with a false teaching, we need to remember that God um, preserves our destiny. And that gives us confidence, right? Because that event is guaranteed to happen. Tyron, you mentioned it earlier. It's non-negotiable. It will happen. The invites have been sent out. They're there. You've just read them in Revelation 19, 8, 7 and 8. And nothing we can do is going to change that. And we are going to arrive there as believers and we will be resplendently beautiful. And we will be pure and holy. And it will be amazing. So let's live our lives praising the Lord that He has that in store for us. And let's live our lives as confident believers focused on that. So we can praise God for what He has done. He preserves our testimony he has our destiny in his hand. Those are things we can always praise him for. In verse 25, we see that Jude's praise turns to praising God for who he is. And he mentions a whole lot of characteristics of God. And um, I love the way he starts here. So he says here, To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority. And I just love the way that he starts off with, to the only God. Now, obviously, Jude is honing in on some characteristics of God that are very relevant, given what he's written in the epistle. And it's like he's saying here to the false teachers, don't come with your own versions of God. Don't come with your versions of Jesus. And don't, don't come with, well, actually, he's a man, or he's a spirit, or actually, he said this, or he did that. There's only one God. There's only one Jesus. Don't come into our churches with your talk of their many roads and their different paths and actually all religion has some kind of benefit. But don't come with this kind of, well, you believe what you believe and I believe what I believe. It just starts off, makes it very clear. There is only one true God. There's only one true Savior. And that is our Lord Jesus Christ. He is a stumbling block to the false teachers and a savior to those who believe him. That's an amen. Thank you. And then Jude runs through some characteristics of God. He mentions four, and we'll look at them in groups of two. So the first thing he mentions is God's glory and God's majesty. Now the interesting thing about these characteristics is, I think for many of us, they are words we kind of generally know. But, and we have a rough idea about, but we haven't necessarily got a deep understanding of them. And so glory is a very interesting uh, word to learn about because the Bible uses the word glory in different ways depending on the situation. Now overall, glory is talking about, you know, my version is everything that's amazing about God is God's glory. But there are in general three ways that glory is used. The first way is 
describe how God is. He is glory. So sometimes glory refers to God's internal characteristics or attributes, or just a way to summarize, who is he? Uh, God is intrinsically glorious. It is part of who he is. Um, in the sense of his fullness, his sufficiency, his majesty, his beauty, his splendor. Uh, Psalm 29.3 says, The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters. So, God is a God of glory. Glory can also talk about how God manifests. How God manifests into his creation. How um, he reveals his presence in his creation. And God manifests himself. Sometimes he reveals his presence physically. Sometimes he displays his attributes. Sometimes he is manifesting in person. For instance, in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, an example of this is in Revelation 15 or Isaiah 6, where it talks about the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And there was smoke all about, the physical presence of the Lord. Or you can think about the tabernacle and the Shekinah glory of the Lord that is in the Holy of Holies. Um, another example of how God manifests His glory is in Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. God's creation cries out and declares His glory to all of us. And so, glory can talk about how God manifests. And then a third kind is what we see Jude doing here. Where glory is used as an action. To give glory. So we can give glory to God. And that is when we uh, respond to God in the form of worship or exaltation. And glorifying God is a very appropriate thing for us to do. Um, Psalm 29 says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. God is due the glory that we give Him. We also glorify God in our choices and how we live our lives, the way we conduct ourselves, the way we speak to people. Everything we do is an opportunity to glorify our God, to give glory to Him. And so that's glory. Majesty has a slightly different idea. Majesty is about highness, about superiority. Uh, most of us will know that royalty likes to use the title, His Majesty. Uh, and that is meant to indicate that they are of a higher station than everybody else. Um, and so majesty is a often a superlative term, meaning higher than, superior to, or mightier than everybody else. And so God is the one of ultimate majesty. He is the highest one. It is right that we think of Him more highly than anybody else. So you have majesty, that highness, that esteem, that superiority. And that is something that um, contributes to the glory of God. The amazingness of Him. So when we praise God, and when we give Him glory, we actually create a virtuous circle of glory. Create a, a virtuous circle of glory. So check this out. So God, who is glorious, He then communicates His glory through His creation, His Word, uh, through us as believers, through uh, things that He does. As God's people, we then respond by glorifying Him. We glorify the Lord. God receives that glory and, through uniting us to Christ, shares His glory with us because we are united with God in Christ. And all of this contributes back again to God's glory. By glorifying Him and Him sharing that glory with us and being glorious, and then all of that also contributes to God's glory. And so you have a circle of glory. The more we glorify God, the more He is glorified, the more we can glorify Him. And so we must praise the Lord. Such an important thing for us to do. We need to cry out and declare that He is glorious. We need to praise Him for His majesty. And we need to be in stark contrast to the false teachers who are disinterested in their own glory, their own popularity, 
uh, what they can get out of this thing. And so that's glory and majesty. Jude goes on to talk about God's power and authority. And again, these sound similar but are different. Uh, God's power is really demonstrated by his ability to accomplish his will in every situation. God's power is demonstrated by his ability to accomplish his will in any situation. And so God's power is always connected to God's will. And we see God's power when we look at how his will has been achieved. Let's look through history. Through God's power, he brought the creation into existence. Through God's power, he has created man. Through God's power, he performed miracles and protected Israel as they escaped Egypt and traveled to the promised land. Through God's power, we have salvation from sin. It was God's power that resurrected Jesus. It's God's power that creates a new person in believers. It's God's power who protects the church. It's God's power that has made sure his word has endured. And it's his power who will glorify us and ultimately result in a new heaven and a new earth. Our God is a God of power. And we can praise him for that. But he's also a God of authority. Authority relates to the freedom or the right to act without hindrance. The freedom or right. And particularly that last part, the right to act without hindrance. So power can give you that freedom. But authority is about the freedom and the right to do something without hindrance, without anyone stopping you. All authority begins with God. We learn that in Romans 13. And he has given us authority. What has he given us authority for? Well, he's given us authority to share the gospel. We have the authority. If someone ever says, well, who gave you the right to tell me this? Well, actually, the, the real answer is God. Christ gave us the authority in Matthew 28, 18. We have the authority to enter God's throne room and pray at any time. Realize when you're praying, you're entering his throne room. We have the authority to be called sons of God. And um, today, God's authority is found in the Bible, in the Word. We all defer to the authority of God's Word. So God gives us authority. He also gives us power. Acts 1 8 says, When you, but you, this is Christ now speaking to his disciples, preparing them for his ascension. And he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Do you ever think about it that way? That God has actually given you his power? I don't know about you, I often feel powerless. I feel daunted by the things I need to do. I feel like, oh, how am I going to manage this? There's too much, or it's too frightening, or that, that obstacle is too scary. We've got to remember that we have two things. We have God's authority, and we have His power. Like, literally. All of that to do His will. That's what we have God's authority and power to do. We've got to lean on that. That's why he says, when you are weak, I am strong. Because he's given us his power. But we need to lean on it. We need to depend on it. We need to rest in his power. And the holy, the, sorry, the false teachers had no authority or power. They didn't have that. So they had to use marketing. That's what they used. They didn't call it in those days, but we know that's what it is. That's why they had to teach the things that would be popular and would be desirable so that they could draw people away from the truth. That's the only error they had in their quiver. We don't need to be like that as believers. We don't need to be popularist. We don't need to appeal and do the things that everybody loves. We don't need to be seeker sensitive, as it were. We have God's power and authority. And that's what we need to act on according to his word. And so that's something we can praise the Lord for. As we go through the week, we can praise the Lord for the authority he has given us. We can praise the Lord for the power that flows from him and that he's given us. We can praise him for his majesty.
can praise him for his glory. We can praise him that he is our only true saviour. And so that's the challenge for us. We need to be praising our God. We need to praise him for what he's done for us. We need to praise him for the incredible destiny that we have. This wedding feast that we can look forward to. We need to praise him for saving us. We need to praise him for keeping us. Preventing us from stumbling. We need to praise him for who he is. Have you ever just stopped and just thought about wow, who he is and just praised? I pray that like the writers of Chronicles, we can say the following. 1 Chronicles 29, 11, it says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and all in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as a head above all. Let's close in prayer. Father, we can do no more than just pray um, these scriptures back to you. Lord, we are so inadequate when it comes to praising you. And you are so glorious and majestic and have done such amazing things for us because you loved us. And Lord, we praise you for the salvation you have worked. We praise you for the way that you're in our lives helping us to stay true to you and walk with you and not to stumble. We praise you for the amazing future that you have laid out for us, uh, the certain future that nothing can change. And most of all, Lord, we just praise you for who you are. You are praiseworthy. You are glory. You are majesty. You are power. You are all authority. And we praise you, Lord. Help us to praise you more. Help us in every moment to remember that now is a good time to praise you. Pray this in your son's name. Amen.